Now, I wonder, will you see? Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're seeing our participants starting to join us. Very excited to have you all. And uh, I think we're just going to reward those who are on time today. And let's just get started introducing ourselves, shall we? Okay. So first of all, I just want to thank all of you who are our panelists. You are all an inspiration to me personally. And I think that a lot of people who are tuning in today are here because of the same reason. They're looking for inspiration or they already know you or they support you and want to hear more from you. Um, it, it's the last day of Women's History Month, so go women. Every single day is Women's History Day, but, you know, we got to just make a little noise during our special month of March. And so what a better way to close this out, this month out, than to bring attention to women who are making moves, making money, and making it happen in their day-to-day -day lives by being investors, real estate investors. And so... Uh, without further ado, I want to thank Amy Goldman, Deandra McDonald, Elise Levy, Natalie Minyard, Pamela Kalmus, and Wendy Wan for being with us today to talk about real estate investing. So shall we get started? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So we've got about 26 participants now. And for those of you who are already here, just a little heads up, we're going to go through a series of questions. And at about 740, we're going to open up the floor for some Q&A. So if you have any questions, just put it right in the Q&A box. And when we get to that section of the um, evening, we will, in, we will, address your questions. Okay, so first of all, let's talk history. I wanna hear from every single one of you, like give us the story, your story. How did you get into real estate investing? So let's start, I said before, I like to be fair, we're gonna do alphabetical order. We're gonna start with you, Amy Goldman. Please tell us about yourself and how you got into real estate. Sure, sure. Um, I started investing in real estate at a young, I guess it, some would consider a young age. I was 24 years old when I bought my first property. And I was really prompted by my, my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather had encouraged me instead of paying rent to buy an apartment. And I didn't think that I could afford an apartment, but when I started looking around and spoke to a lender, I realized that I could. And I, I made my first investment. I invested in a, a tiny little two bedroom condo in Morristown, New Jersey. And it turned out to be a really good investment. I, I, I don't sit still well which anyone that knows me knows my personality. I'm always moving. Um, but I lived there for about a year and I, I purchased that unit for, I think it was 125 and I sold it for 179. Not bad. So a good profit. I'm not going to date myself, but it was a very long time ago. <laughs> we'll just say that I, I stayed the same age for the last 20 something years, right? <laughs> but it, it worked out to be a really good investment. And it kind of gave me the flavor for how you can make money in real estate and how you can be excited about making money in real estate and how you don't have to be um, you know, a professional real estate developer or somebody who comes from a lot of money or somebody who has you know, a background of, of a family who understands those kinds of businesses. Because I came from a family where my father was a typesetter and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. So I didn't really have a real, a real estate role model per se. Um, and it ended up actually personally in financial services. I'm the president and founder of a wealth management firm here in Hoboken, New Jersey. And because of my experience young, I was starting young with real estate, I now actually encourage all of my investment clients to look at real estate as well as a, a portion of the portfolio, because it really adds a non-correlated asset and a way to invest in something that's not going to react the same way that the stock markets do. Um, so to this day, I still am a very, very big proponent of real estate and I, I do more now than I ever have before. So. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Okay, Deandra, tell us a bit about your history and how you got into real estate investing. Absolutely. So I got into real estate investing because when I graduated college, I could not find a job. And so I was working five or six part-time jobs in order to like keep my head above water. It's 22. And for those of you who have student loans, you know, you have those beautiful six months after graduation to have no loan payment, and kind of figure your life out. But by the time November came around, I was in no better space than what I was before. And when I stopped feeling sorry for myself and realized like, I gotta make a change, 
I looked at my budget and realized my two biggest expenses were housing and my loans, right? I couldn't do anything about my loans, but I figured if I could get a house, I was paying like $800 a month for a terrible apartment. If I could get a two bedroom house and I could rent out the other bedroom, at minimum, I could lower that housing cost. And that's what happened. So after about two years of saving up and putting everything together and trying to pay down the debt, I bought a two bedroom house and rented out that second bedroom and have not paid rent or a mortgage since. So that that first one was super addicting and just never looked back. And uh, talking price-wise, right? I bought that property for $85,000. I'm in Virginia. Um, it just reappraised for 180 and uh, the mortgage on that property, as it, it didn't know really about investments then. The mortgage on that property is currently 550 and it rents for 1400. So it is one of those like falling into something great. And then I've been chasing that high, I think, ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. That's for sure. And, you know, and I tell people about you, Deandra, because I follow you on Instagram and I have been for a long time and I'm constantly sharing your profile with people. And I say, she retired at 28. She was 28 years old when she retired. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I was, I finally did get a job uh, <laughs> working at a lab, making 28,000 a year. So you guys know, killing the game. And every time I say that, you can tell who's like doing well financially because your faces are like, ah. <laughs> I was making 28,000 a year. I, I then switched over to teaching about a year later um, because I missed the more direct impact than being in a lab by myself with bacteria all day. Um, but I realized there was a cap on teaching, right? Financially, that no matter how hard I worked, even though I loved what I was doing, the county couldn't pay me any more than that. So I decided to retire when my real estate investments were finally making more than my teaching salary. Because at that point, it's like, well, why am I here, if not for financial reasons, right? Uh, or if not for personal reasons. So last year was my retirement year. And I, I might go back, but now I can go back on like my terms, which is really nice. Like, mm, I don't want to teach that class. Nope, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, power. Yeah. Money is power. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Deandra. Okay. Elise, tell us a bit about your history and how you bought your own properties, please. Got it. Um, so, First of all, I am in the mortgage business. I am a mortgage banker and I help people finance their real estate. So it would be kind of ridiculous if I didn't walk the walk and also own real estate that I financed. Um, so in 1999, um, against what is now my ex-husband's wishes, I wanted to buy a co-op in Manhattan. He thought, oh my gosh, it's the top of the market. Um, and he, he was always somebody who really tried to time the market. And I said, listen, like many of you women have said, listen, I'm paying out this money every month. It's ridiculous that I'm not having it go towards an asset that could potentially appreciate, even though he thought it was the top of the market. And at that time, it kind of was for, for that period of time. Um, and that I was getting no tax write-offs for those payments that I was making in rent. Because between those two things, between the potential appreciation and getting your tax, you know, write-offs, um, it, it was just ridiculous to continue renting. And so that was in 1999. And you've seen what's happened, you know, in the market since 1999, because that was quite a while ago that the property value has, you know, gone up almost, you know, to 200% at least since, since I had bought that, you know, that first piece of property. Um so that's, that's, you know, seeing that and just, just really understanding the components of, um, of, of, an, of an appreciable asset. And rule number one, when you're the moderator, unmute. Right. <laughs> Um, thank you. Okay, Natalie, tell us a bit, a bit about your real estate investment journey, please, and, and who you are. Yeah. Okay, Natalie Minyard, uh, broker of record here at Triple Mint, and um, I got into real estate um, back when I was 25, 
and took my first commission as a realtor and bought my first investment property. Um, it was a one bedroom walk up, but I thought, oh my gosh, someone's going to give me a mortgage. This is amazing. I took um, the commission from this, from purchasing that and uh, combined that in. And this was back when, you know, it was a little looser for, for lending. And I bought this, the, my first spot, I had tenants in there um, paying the rent plus. I was making a few hundred bucks a month and I ended up selling it to them a couple of years later for twice what I paid and 1031s that into a multifamily and just kind of kept going from there. So it is definitely a, uh, an addiction and I know it helped me in my real estate career because, you know, I, I got to understand the process uh, early on. Um, so I was able to help people a little bit more myself had I gone through it. So yes, big fan. Mm -hmm. Love that, love that, thank you. Okay, Pam, tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into real estate investing. Hey everybody, Pamela Kalmus. Um, been selling real estate for about eight years. Before that, I did property management. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how that's helped me uh, with being a landlord and um, kind of analyzing properties as well, not just on the financial side. Um, but I first got into real estate investing. I had some extra money when I got into real estate and had been talking with a few people about what I was going to do with it. And one of my very good friends, uh, who's also a real estate agent just said like, you know, you should do what you know, you know, you know, real estate, like, why would you put it in the market? And to me, that sounded really smart. So, um, that's what I did. The first one was a, um, a two family property in Jersey city, which has been very, uh, profitable and, and parlayed into other opportunities. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Wendy, please share with us a bit about who you are and how you got into real estate. And just so everyone understands, Wendy was stuck in traffic. And so she's joining us from her car. We're like, you're such a wheeler and dealer. You're on the go. So thank you, Wendy. Yeah. And I uh, apologize in advance if I uh, get cut out somehow. Um, but very quickly, um, I'm Wendy Wan, and uh, I am a real estate agent. Um, I haven't been um, an agent for so long, but my first purchase of real estate is uh, is done when I was 24. Um, so I always knew that I needed to buy something instead of renting. So that I kind of, you know, it wasn't really an investment property, but it certainly got me started. Um, course once you have one you want another and then you just kind of grow from there uh so now i have uh i also help other my clients manage properties and i help them grow their wealth through real estate and i have now a multi-family i've done you know for myself i have a condo a co-op um now a multi-family and uh about to invest in a kind of a vacation home um so yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. <laughs> I love this. I just love hearing from successful women who are, who are making moves. And, you know, they really say that you become the composite of the five people that you surround yourself with. So it's important to be around like-minded people who are all about winning. And um, so, you know, so to that point, I really believe money is an energy and it's something that you attract to yourself. Some people feel like it's just not like possible for them kind of thing. And other people seem to attract a lot of money. And I've talked to most of you before this program and you gave me a little inkling of like how much money you make from investing. And I just love to hear it. So what I want to know from you is what would you say to someone who wants to attract money to their lives? And I want to just open the floor actually so that if somebody who wants to share can please jump in. I'll I'll piggyback on what you had said. Actually, I think you really need to surround yourself with people who are positive, who really want to make moves, as you put it. Um, and also think, as far as believing you deserve it or don't deserve it, you know, all of us grew up with things that shaped who we are today. And I think a lot of people come from that belief of deserving or not deserving money because things that happened to them earlier in their life. They were programmed to believe one thing or another. 
And I feel this is, I use this analogy all the time with my clients who I do financial planning for. You have to feed your brain like a computer. The input that you bring in has to be healthy and productive. And the input that you find coming at you that doesn't serve you, you need to find a way to serve that to somebody else because you, you really just have to have really positive people around you and the belief that you deserve it. And if you know, if you can identify that you're believing that you don't deserve that kind of wealth or the money that you, you know, could, could attain through uh, managing real estate, then you have to find a way to kind of reprogram your brain like a computer to, to change that. So um, there's a, a Gary V line that I love that stop making excuses and make moves. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Pam. Yes. So, um, I, I have a quote that I, I like to use and, I, and I'm like a grinder. I like to work hard, play hard, you know, like I do everything full out, but I always say like, you know, people think that it's so easy. You know, I say for every buyer I have, like I have to work with, I have to talk to 10 people, you know? So one of the quotes that I love that I often remind myself and will tell other people is that luck favors those who work hard. So that's one of the things that I say often. So true. If I were to add, it would be that you were probably taught one way of how to make money and that way is completely valid, but that does not mean that there aren't other ways um, because I am not a grinder. I am so lazy. Oh God, I'm so lazy. I don't want to work at all. And one of the books that kind of changed my life was the four hour work week of understanding that there are people who make a lot more than I do doing a lot less than I do. And that is also an option. And originally, or the old me would have thought, would have been skeptic of it, right? Would have been skeptic of these like women on this screen who are claiming to make seven figures because I'd be like, that's not real because that's not what I know. That's not what my circle did. That's not what my parents did. But as I've gotten older, recognizing like, oh, there are other ways to do this. There are, and they are all valid. And you have to choose what you want to follow. Um, that is what ex has exposed me a lot to the idea that money can come to you in a bunch of different ways, but you have to respect that you were given this really tiny slice of things and that there's so much more out there. I had a really good friend say to me early on, find the deal and the money will come. That's right. Because that, you know, in your brain, oh my gosh, where am I going to come up with this cash or this money? It, you figure it out, you know, there, like you said, there's so many different ways, uh, you know, to, to come to make a deal work um, and being creative and studying and being around smart people that can give you pointers. I mean, you know, there are, there are so many different ways to make it happen. So find the deal and then figure out how to make it happen. And also believe in yourself, right? You had to believe that you deserve this, first of all. Um, I think money attracts money. Uh, you have to embody that abundance that money will come to you. Then it, it, will, it will do it. It, it. If you work hard or you want to work less hard, that's okay too. Uh, but you have to believe in yourself and you will figure it out. Yeah. I agree. At least, yeah. You just have to take that, you know, that first big leap and get past that first big leap. And it's really scary the first time you're buying. It's like the biggest financial decision you've made but you have to just you have to just like just keep you know at, at some point you you've thought to yourself this is a good idea keep going with that thought don't let other people influence you if you hear other people say oh I think the market is going to go lower this or that just go with your own gut and just keep barreling forward mm -hmm. love that uh, you know, we talk a lot about women's intuition, and while, of course, everybody has intuition, I, I mean, I just really believe that women's intuition is like a separate type of thing, and I'm curious to hear from you, to your point, Elise, you know, like, when people are telling you one thing, but you have a feeling, and my question to you all is, how has your women's intuition guided you towards success in your real estate journey, you know, thus far? I, I can speak to that. Um, actually, uh, one of my, my most recent real estate investment um, was last September. This was about five months before COVID. I had heard that real estate prices had dropped a lot in the Hamptons. And to me, the Hamptons was never anything 
within reach for me. I was like, oh, I'm never going to buy there. It's always going to be overpriced. And I was like, really? You can get deals in the Hamptons right now? Let me just go there and check it out. So I took a day, looked at 10 houses. The last house that I saw, I thought, wow, this is in a good area. And I should really just make an offer and see what happens. I, sh I, I really need to go for this. And I just was listening to a lot of people say to me, no, prices are going to go down more. You know, maybe you should wait. And I just said, you know what? I got to do this. I think this is the right opportunity given all the factors I just mentioned. And even as I'm signing the contract, I'm nervous. I'm thinking, is it, is it the right time? I'm like, you know what? I'm never going to fail at this because I could always rent it out. You know, I, 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 just, I just had to turn off everybody else in my head. And I, I mean, I could have never predicted that COVID was going to happen and that, you know, the prices were going to go through the roof in the Hamptons after that. But it's just really about trusting your instincts. Agreed. I can add on. I think where I think I felt it most was with property management and tenants directly. Coming from a public school classroom as a teacher, having to learn that each child you might have an overall structure of how things are supposed to go. You have your laws and your legalities you have to follow, but that each child has to be treated differently. Some can take a firmer hand and, and, and need it, and some need it to be a more soft mothering role. And learning that I had to apply that same feeling to tenants, right? Which I have a lot of older tenants who might need a little more hand-holding and a little more constant presence to feel comfortable and to feel supported than my younger tenants who might need the little reminder of like noise violations and such, right? But that has helped me keep a mixed neighborhood in my like bigger multifamilies that I think with proof with COVID, right? That I haven't lost any tenants, that I don't have anyone back on rent. And I think part of that is that I have been pouring into you guys individually for so long because I was taught as a teacher that if you want to have successful trust relationships, that's what you have to do. Um, and it reminds me of like how my mom like poured into us. So that would be mine is more the management side. Good point. I completely, yeah, I completely agree. It's all the people that we had to deal with in this whole process of buying, managing, owning, renting, selling, the whole process. We have to deal with so many people with different personality. And I think our intuition can really work for us to know how to speak to each one of them to get what you want in the end. Yeah, I moved to Jersey City 25 years ago. Uh, I mean, when I got into real estate and people heard I worked in Jersey City, I mean, I got like weird looks, but I didn't understand that because I loved Jersey City. I've loved it. The minute I, I got here, how, you know, the, the transportation, the views, the, you know, having everything at your doorstep. And I, to me, how could I not invest and buy here? And trust me, I had plenty of people. I came from Florida, $75,000 was all, it, I mean, it is a lot of money, but, you know, compared to what I knew that it was a good deal. I knew that I knew my stuff at 25. I don't know how I had the guts to do that because, uh, you know, a lot of people were telling me what, it, a fourth floor walk up. What are you nuts? And all I could see was the view. I had to view the city. Like, so what, you know, I didn't, and, and so I think that, you know, some of it is trust yourself, trust what, you know, you know, some of it's intuition, but some of it's, you, you're, you know, we love what we do. So we're reading, we're, we're scrolling through the internet. We're following people on, on, you know, Instagram and, and clubhouse and, you know, believe in ourselves. We, we know what we're doing. And if something looks good, it, it's, it's intuition, but it's also, we know our stuff. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd love to add something to that if I could. Please. I think that a lot of times people get really wrapped up in their head. And I say this to, again to clients all the time, 1% to 10% of the world makes the kind of money that you want to make. Mm. And if you want to make that kind of money, you have to be willing to do what one to 10%, depending on how much money you want to make, right? If you want to be the top 10% in income or the top 1%, you have to be willing to take chances and take risks and do things that the other 90% are not willing to do. That's right. So the people who are counseling you and saying, 
oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Maybe you're wrong. And then create that little smidge of self-doubt or self, you know, self-questioning. Those are probably people that would, would might be fair, afraid to take that move themselves, right? If that makes sense. So I think that driver of not just having the intuition to make those decisions, but also having enough faith and confidence in yourself to say, I've made the decision and now I'm sticking with it. And you can say what you want and you and you and you and you, but I'm here and I'm doing me and that's it, right? So I think that is kind of like another piece of it. It's the confidence of knowing that, again, 90% of the people won't make the kind of moves that you're willing to make because you want it that bad. Yes, Pam. Okay, hi. So um, I definitely use intuition. I've said like every time I've got into a house that I purchased, I know right away. Like I can step in and I'm and I I can envision where everything's going. You know who might be attracted to this type of rental, how much it might command, what I can change to make it command more money. Um, so I definitely do that. But then what I recommend to clients and what I always do myself too, is I go to the neighborhood coffee shop and I sit there for like half a day and I just to get the vibe of the neighborhood to kind of see what's going on. I think it's a great way, even just to validate what you're feeling. Like you're going around and you're like, I'm feeling so good about this neighborhood, but it just, it's always helped me like make a, a final decision. Like I, I love this neighborhood and then I'll sit there and I'm like, okay, everything I thought was right, you know? And so I think um, that helps me, uh, you know, and, and helps other clients as well. Okay, great. Well, you know, I've, I've gotten to the question that I think everybody wants answered and how much money are we talking? So I'd love to hear from you, you know, like what kind of money are you seeing without going too personal, obviously, because the point of today's presentation and panel is really about encouraging, inspiring, enabling, empowering women, and of course, anyone who wants to invest or grow their portfolio. And sometimes you gotta show people the money in order for them to be inspired. So why don't we start with you, Amy? Tell us tell us some of your success stories. Sure, I'll, I will tell you some of my success stories, but I will say one other thing before I get started there. Please. Uh, I manage a lot of money for clients through my, my practice. And I would say that probably 50 to 60% of the people that come to me with assets have passive income. And so it's no coincidence that people who have a lot of assets, who have accumulated a lot of wealth are invested in something that provides passive income. And obviously when you think of passive income, most people automatically think of real estate. And so that was another reason why I kind of got interested because I would bring on a new client and they would come in, oh, I have like a million and a half and I'm just not sure what I should be investing in. And I have another six or 700,000 in real estate. And like, where did they get all this money? And then, oh, I have this much income coming in every month. So it, you, you start to hear that story enough times, you start scratching your head and saying, okay, I want to do this too, right? So I invested in real estate for a very long time, but I got a lot more serious about it a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, the example that I gave at the beginning of this call, my very first purchase, I made, you know, I think it was like $54,000 on my very first purchase. As a 24-year-old, I was like, what? That's crazy. So, so then I bought another house, which, and this was, this was actually a very valuable lesson for me. I rolled that money into another house and ended up making like $125,000 on. And then the next house that I purchased was a house in Mendham, New Jersey. And if anyone knows me in person, they know that I am always in high heels and I'm, well, actually these days it's a little different, but <laughs> pre-COVID, pre-COVID, I was always in high heels. And I, when I was a single girl, I was out all the time and I had the type of job where I entertained a lot and so forth and so on. Well, I moved to Mendham, New Jersey, which is very residential. And I bought a fixer upper. And while I was ripping the kitchen out and fixing the windows and restaining the hardwood floors and ripping out carpeting and doing all the things living there that I was doing, I got a visit at like two o'clock in the morning from a bear in my backyard. I sold that property and there's a lesson here. I sold that one at a loss. I lost money on it because I was like, I do not belong in Benton, New Jersey with a bear <laughs> in my backyard. Nope, that's not me. That's not this person, right? So I lost, I think it was about $15,000 on that one. And I think the lesson that you have to learn is be careful what you take on because it's not always the right decision for you. You know, you might be excited about it. And on that particular one, my intuition was right. The value of the home went up significantly about two years after I sold it. The people after me, 
that finished the work that I started ends up making like $150,000 on the sale. So that was a little painful pill to swallow and I should probably stop looking at tax records. But, but the bottom line was I learned from that, that, you know, although you can make money on some properties, you can lose money if you make an emotional decision about money. Mm -hmm. And that was the root of where I was going with all this. When you make decisions, when they're about investing in something, it can't be emotional. I think intuition is important, but you have to make an educated decision and don't be emotional about it. So the non-emotional most recent investment that I made was a home that we purchased in the Jersey Shore. Um, we purchased it for $480,000 roughly. Um, I'm being told that it's worth six and a quarter now, 625,000. That was one year ago. I will mind you, I closed the first week of May in the middle of the height of COVID. Like there was, we couldn't do a closing. The title people showed up with two masks on and the face shield, it was like the whole thing. Um, but I've made $49,000 in income in the first 12 months on that property and anticipate to make a little bit more this year in income. Wow. Property's a lot of work, but it's been a great investment and we've been really enjoyed having it for one month a year for ourselves. So that's, that's the other piece of it. Fantastic. Yeah, 49,000 in a year, that's nothing to sneeze at. Okay, Deandra, please share a, some of your success with us. Yeah, so I get asked this question a lot on Instagram, TikTok, all these things about like, how much do you make? And not dodging, I will answer the question, but I do like to ask people to really process what, what they're trying to validate with that question, right? Um, because I think sometimes we hear these great big numbers, which are very inspirational, but that's not what our lives necessarily look like. I knew for me that as a teacher, I was making $48,000 a year and I just needed to hit that. Once I could consistently make $48,000 a year from my rental properties, I don't have to work as a teacher anymore. I can spend my five hours a week managing my properties and then do whatever else it is that I wanted to do. Um, if that was starting my online company, if that was stay at home with future kids, if that was spend more time with my aging parents. Um, and I'm going to ask you very nicely to bleep out that aging part because they're going to get <laughs> real testy when they see this later. But um, I left teaching last year when I, after the third year of consistently making 50000 a year for my rentals. And um, that's when I said, like, I'm good for my long-term rentals. Because I also have short-term rentals. We do flips. I have my online business. But I knew that piece of my foundation was steady. And that's when I decided to leave the classroom. So when my properties were consistently making 50. Amazing. I love that. Okay, Natalie, please share. So I did. I mentioned the one that I, I purchased um, first. And I... Uh, a year after that one, I purchased another one. I mean, once I realized that how I was like, people were willing to give me money, I wanted to keep doing it. Um, uh, the first one I bought pretty much as an investment and had renters in it. And then I, and I was still renting at the time myself. Um, the numbers made more sense to put somebody in that one. And then I went ahead and bought a, another property that I got to move into. And it was the most you know, at that age to feel like I was a, like I owned my own home. I mean, it was just not even something that I, I always knew I wanted to do that, but at, at, uh, at that age to be able to do that, it felt very empowering. Um, the, I still have that two bedroom condo in the Heights. It has allowed me to, I've refied, I've cashed out, I've used it as leverage and it's allowed me to buy other properties. Um, and I still have it and I have lovely tenants in there now. Um, I bought, uh, like I said, I bought a multifamily to Amy's point. Um, the mistakes are part of it. Um, you know, I purchased in little, little, uh, um, a little quickly. I, I purchased in West Virginia. I fell in love with a historic property. I love historic properties. And I got online with my mom and looked through all the pictures and like two days later I was buying it. Here we go. We're getting it. And um, I think uh, overall it was a good investment if I had just put renters in there, but I decided it's too pretty. We got to do something fun in here. And I think if I had just put uh, true renters in there, I probably would still have that property. Um, the challenge with that one was I was so far away. I made my money here. I just fell in love with this property there. Um, and, but the funny thing is, is now you know, my mom and my sister, her family, they're all back down in West Virginia. And that property actually would have been really nice to still have. 
And, you know, I bought a couple of other ones and it's each one has kind of allowed me to buy another one and buy another one. And, uh, and I'm just excited to start even doing some more, um, keep going. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Pam. Hi. Okay. So I'm going to talk more in terms of profit. And, um, so the first thing I want to say too, in terms of like, not, it's not making mistakes, but what's, what's a really great investment versus what's just like an okay investment, but also you have to figure out what investment's right for you. So, um, I bought properties that I've lived in and then rented afterwards and then sold one of them. And we still have one of them. Um, but I will say that those pretty much break even, which breaking even isn't bad in my opinion. And I tell clients sometimes like, okay, you can pay rent, right? But you know, you can buy this, you can live in it for a year or two, and then you could rent it out and you could only put 10 or 20% down. And then in 20 or 30 years, somebody else pays the rest off of something you only put 10 or 20% in. Like what other investment are you going to, are you going to, you know, put 10% in and one day own a hundred percent. So in, in that regard, um, I do think homes that you live in can be a good investment. But when I talk about like making profit, it's more on true investment. So uh, and, and I also invest with other people. So these aren't all mine um, individually, but I'm going to give you some numbers in terms of profit. So there's two multifamilies in Jersey City. They're both in different areas. Neither of them are downtown or the Heights, which are traditional areas that people know, um, but they're all um, near transportation. So I'm big on purchasing near transportation, public transportation. And um, one of them we purchased at 477 about four or five years ago. And the other one we purchased at 650 about two or three years ago. And they both after expenses, mortgages, insurance, you know, every cost make about 2000 a month. Mm. So, um, so, and I love multifamilies. It's like really into that. Um, and then two uh, beach rental properties that are more like short term. So monthly, weekly. And just to kind of give an idea, one is more geared towards monthly and that one, they both cost about 60 grand a year. And the one that's more monthly makes, makes 60 grand in the summer. So June, July, August will cover the whole cost for the year. So whatever is made throughout the rest of the year is all gravy, which is less, right? Because summer commands more, but let's say it's an average of, I don't know, on the low end, five grand a month. Um, so so you get the idea. So, you know, something somewhere around 30 to 40 grand a year if you rent it out continually um, throughout the year. And then the other one, um, also a beach uh, property, also costs about 60 grand a year. And that one is more of a weekly rental. And that actually makes 7,500 a week in season. So, excuse yeah. me, 7,500 a week in season. Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely work. Weekly rentals are, are like not my preference at all. Um, but this one came about, I had actually been um, showing clients in the area and compared to the prices of the properties and what they were making in rent, I mean, it, you know, I couldn't believe it. So jumped in, um, I have experience with shorter term um, turnover from my property management experience. From when I first started, I did student housing. And in the summer, you know, we did nine months. And then in the summer, we did three months. And then sometimes we did weekly for like international students. So I'm more accustomed to doing it. Uh, not that I love it, but um, uh, it, it, it pays off in this particular case. So that's just a little bit of the numbers there. Ah, so inspiring, so inspiring. Okay, thank you. Okay, Wendy, please share. All right, I think everybody, that, that's very impressive um, from what everybody said. Um, so I can, I can go quickly. Um, so I gross about 10K a month right now, mm -hmm. just on passive income. Um, that's not, you know, that just, just collecting rent at the beginning of the month. It comes in into my bank account. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's quite nice. Obviously, um, you know, it's, I, I think for any future investors, I would say, you can be sitting on the beach and watch that money come in. It's the nicest feeling to know that, you know, it just rolls in. Um, obviously, there's some, you know, being 
there's work to be done, but but passive income, it's 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 great. It allows you to do all the things. Uh, so yeah. So 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 true. Okay, now. I'd love to hear from each of you or whomever has a, re a response to share. Give us a tip, a negotiation tip for winning as a woman in the world of real estate. I can start. Um, for me, I feel like as any investment, you want to try to buy low and sell high. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you can manage to do that, I think you're, you're halfway through, <laughs> you know, if you like, you know, it's not, it's no different from buying stock, but you do see it. You, you want to see it not to hold on forever. You're going to hold it, see the appreciation, sell it. And hopefully in the meantime, you have the rent that you collect. Right. So, uh, yeah, try to buy low and sell high. That is, that's my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And in terms of negotiating, you know, negotiating is hard. Oh, sorry. It can be, it can be, it can be challenging, especially if you're new to it. So what, what tips would you give as a woman to win in the world of real estate? Pam, well, I can, I can say, speak to that. So this is one thing that, and I don't want to generalize that all women are like this, but this has been one thing for me that's been super helpful. I'm, I'm really chatty. And so I'll talk a lot. I'll say a lot. In negotiations, I try and say as little as possible. So I'm always wanting the other side to speak more. So I'll ask a question and 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 if there even if there's awkward silence, I'll just wait for the other person to speak because I want to hear what's going to come out of their mouth first. And I think that, you know, as women, we want people to feel comfortable. Um, you know, so if there's that awkward silence, we fill it with something, but it's much better in my in my opinion and in negotiations, and it's been helpful for me is to always wait to see what the other person's gonna say. Um, I'll piggyback. I, at this point, invest, where I buy and hold are exclusively multifamilies. And I am the chattiest chat box I can be. I'm like, tell me everything, tenants. When I'm walking through those doors, because when you're negotiating multifamily, right, you're gonna get a rent roll, you're gonna get what their numbers are and what, how they are presenting the property. But especially because I'm going to a lot of like distressed sellers or situations that uh, need some more on-site management. I want to know what the renters think. I want to know what the tenants feel and have it written down, right? Have it videotaped of like, what are the issues? What is happening? He told me this roof is fixed. You're saying there's a leak. He said he owned these appliances. You're saying you own the appliances. But that helps so much when I get to the table because I can say this is the reality of what your building is. I know what you're presenting it as, but this is what it is as of May th March 31st, 2021. Um, and the other piece I would add as a woman, so talk to the tenants, um, but the other piece is to not be emotionally attached. Like this is not an emotional game. This is, does the numbers make sense? And we might have intuition and a lot of us have talked about like a gut feeling, but that is different than emotions. Like a gut, it has some sort of instinct behind it, some educated instinct versus like, it's pretty, or it would help the old ladies, people, or it's in a great, you, there has to be math and logic leading and not your emotional. So that way you can walk away if they don't negotiate or play ball the way you want. Love that. I would I would actually I'll add two things there. Um, first, never let them see you sweat. So kind of going on what, what Pam had said earlier, you know, oftentimes they'll make an offer on a property. And when you're investing, you're often offering a lot less than what they're asking, right? Because you're trying to get a deal because you want you want the right ROI, right? Uh, return on investment. Sorry. <laughs> So oftentimes when you're making a lower offer, you know, you're not, you may not get a response right away and you may get a response right away. That's not the one that you wanted. And sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is wait, whether it's to wait to reply, whether it's to, if, if, if they're supposed to get back to you in 24 hours and 36 hours have gone by, it's just like dating. Maybe he's just not that into you, or maybe you just need to wait another 12 hours before you call to follow up, right? You don't want to be eager. This isn't the only thing you have going on. 
And then the second piece of it, I would say, um, the second piece of advice I would give in that, in that realm is women are traditionally gatherers. Be a hunter, don't be a gatherer. And what I mean by that is once you've made the decision to buy a property, you know, put together a spreadsheet, look at the price per square foot, look at the location, look at the taxes, the HOA, look at all the necessary information to make an educated, as, as you had said, right? You may want to make an educated decision, make an offer. They don't accept your offer. That's fine. It's don't be emotional about it, but keep it on the spreadsheet because in a month when it hasn't sold, you may go back in there. In two months, if it hasn't sold, you may go back in there, right? So, and, and I think not being emotional about a property and knowing in your mind, before you even make an offer, what you're willing to spend on that property is a really powerful tool. The mistake that I see a lot of people make is they'll say, okay, I'm willing to spend $350,000. And they're like, oh, I'll go up to three seventy five dollars because you know what, $25,000 over the next 15 years, what difference does that make anyway? actually makes a big difference on your ROI and your return. So I would say those two things, be a hunter, keep that sheet, keep a spreadsheet active and ready with all of the pertinent information that's gonna feed into your profitability, the costs, so forth and so on. And also, you know, silence is golden. But you know, a lot, I think that goes a long way as far as just kind of keeping it on lock and see where they come, let them come to you, so. I think being prepared, really prepared to kind of piggyback off that and have your team in place, have the attorneys that you trust, have the lender that you trust, um, you know, have your, you know, basically your architect, your, your contractors be ready for, um, for, you know, actually getting that, that, uh, that place. And, you know, and maybe you have to adjust slightly. I mean, that's again, working with a great lender that can say, well, we could do this or you could do this, um, you know, or again, having a contractor that can come in and say, well, if you change this or you put a wall up there, maybe you can make it two bedrooms or one bedroom or you can, you know, convert this or, um, you know, I think going in with as much, um, you know, power behind you, um, you know, we're, we are, we are women here as Aurora, but there's nothing wrong with having all the resources in place. It makes us look stronger when we're making the offers and it makes us more confident we're, when we're going after it as well. I love that. Okay. I want to talk a bit um, with particularly Elise about financing because there's people who want to do this. They want to take the next step. So Elise, can you give us some information about what the requirements are for financing? Yeah, well, well, first of all, before you even start, once you get up the courage, you're going to do it. You've, met, you've got your mindset. Yeah, definitely. Um, like Natalie says, get organized, get, get, get out there and, and get your pre-approval and make sure you, you know, you, you, um, you, you know exactly what it's going to cost. So nothing's going to be a surprise to you. So you're entirely prepared. Um, and some of the things that we look at in determining, um, whether you're able to qualify is number one, do you have enough money to make the down payment and you have enough money for the closing costs? as well as reserves left over. And we are also going to look at whether you have um, the income to support the payments. And part of that income, particularly if you're buying um, an investment um, with an income producing property is we will use the rental income to qualify you. And um, if you're wondering how much that is, we will use 75% of the rental income on the property that you're buying. Um, um, to, to qualify you. Um, and you want to make sure, um, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's what we're able to do, but you want to make sure that the lender that you're working with does that too, because some lenders don't count the rental income. So you just want to make sure that if you need that, that they're counting the rental income. And typically when they're looking at what we call debt to income, which is your housing expense relative to your income, a lot of lenders, the, the rule of thumb is they don't want to see that that's going to exceed 43% of your income. The other piece of it is your credit score. They want to see that you have a high credit score. Um, you're going to get your best rates if your credit score is above 740. So you just want to make sure that all of this is in check before you go out there um, making offers on properties. Would be great. And, you know, there's, I'm sure there are people in our audience watching who definitely want to invest. Maybe they haven't even started saving yet. What advice would you all share with them, at least as well, like how they can get in the game? I mean, certainly 
Thankfully, we live in a country where you can pretty much do anything you put your mind to. So what would you share about, you know, to someone who's like, I'm not ready? I would say for the people who are working, right, who are trying to like put away money every month. I know a lot of us follow people who might talk about budgeting and talking about like scrimping and sacrificing. You got to save. I would really say if you are going to, if you're saving earned income, then really attack your two highest, two or three highest budget line items. Um, don't stress as much of, I, I still have this thing where I'm like in the grocery store with the ground beef and there's the 5.99 one, but then there's a 6.06 and you're like, you know what, you know what, 5.99, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get the cheaper one and save that six cents. And somehow that still feels like I'm saving money. And I wanna say, don't focus on those, right? We're not focusing on the $2 bagel. We're focusing on, are you spending $1,600 in rent? Can we get that down to nine so you can pocket that money? Do you have, um, I just recently helped a client refinance their student loans, right? If you're paying $800 student loans, can we get that down to five? But you still live like you're paying eight and save that other $300. Don't stress yourself out about driving to Costco to get the $2 percent cheaper gas when there are some true issues with your budget that should be attacked. Um, that would be my biggest for people looking to save from earned income. Sounds great. I think that credit, at least his point, credit, credit, credit. I mean, the reason that I was able to get a loan at all, I mean, I didn't have, I was a bartender and just started real estate, but I had excellent credit. And I mean, I, the loans that I was, the loan I was able to get back then, I, you know, don't know that that would happen now, but like, that was the only reason I was able is because I had very, very good credit. And that's um, obviously something even now making sure that you do, you know, so, so if you're even thinking about it, start getting involved in that. And there are specialists that can help you, you know, that can get you ready, you know, so that you are um, getting the best rates, getting the best um, loan options uh, for you. And so much of that is credit. It's not even just the money that you have in hand. And then you can play with it. I mean, you can play with all kinds of different credit, credit cards, HELOCs, you know, line of credits. It's, um, but the credit is really important to play the game. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at how little you really need to put down, particularly if it's a, you know, your first time buying. Um, the, the conforming limits right now are up to 822,000 here in the five boroughs of New York. You could go in even on an FHA loan and put three and a half percent down on a primary residence or second home that ultimately, you know, you get into your first place and then after you know you're making more money, then you move on to your next place. But you got in for you know three and a half percent. And if you can, you know, in a market like this where it's you know it's been a buyer's market, you could you know try to negotiate to have the seller pay your closing costs and just pay that three and a half percent. And you could you know get it you know get in for like twenty thousand dollars. And Elise, um, you also know of like the VA right for veterans. Yes. So yeah. So for our our veterans who have served, and if any of you are on the call, thank you very much for serving. Um, you know, we're very good to our veterans. For veterans, you don't have to put anything down, zero. <laughs> so um, if if you know, a lot of times veterans won't take advantage of that benefit. But yeah, very little, no down, and um, you know, with both both the the government. Um, sponsored loans, there's, there's uh, a lot more flexible guidelines. Wonderful. If I could add one other tool that might be interesting to people. Um, if you're a first time buyer and you plan to live in the property, you can actually take a loan against your 401k. Now, let me preface this by saying, I don't encourage people to, to buy things with money they don't quote unquote have, right? But you did save that 401k money for the purpose of saving for retirement investing. And if you're going to live in that home, it is your primary residents. So I, you know, for the right situation, I actually would encourage a client to do that if it made sense for them. If they and it's not liquidating the 401k, it's borrowing against it. And when you're borrowing against it, you're paying yourself back. So it's pretty much better to pay yourself back interest than paying interest back to somebody else. You're paying it to yourself. So for, and that's why they're willing to um, allow that because you're borrowing from your own asset that's backed. 
and and by the way, the um, the other consideration there, obviously, right, is you have to pay the mortgage, and then you also have to pay back the four hundred one k. And there are, are a lot of flexible terms on paying back the four hundred one k, but you have to bear all that in mind, of course. But that is one other tool that I've had people use. Super um, smart, Pam. Please. So two two thoughts. Um, I love the three and a half percent down first time home buyers, especially in a, in a multifamily home. Um, love to see people doing that. You know, live in it for a year or two, and then move wherever you want. You know. And then you have one or two additional incomes coming in. It's a great wealth builder for someone looking to get started in real estate. Um, it's, it's an awesome tool. So that's one thought. And then the other thought is, you know, um, working in an area where the prices are very expensive, if somebody really wants to get into real estate, but they can't afford, there's two options, right? Invest with other people that you trust and you like, Um and then you don't have to bear all the responsibility, right? There's also um, shared um, risk, right? So maybe you feel better about that. There's also shared responsibility, you know? So for instance, on, you know, a couple of the properties, I do all the property management, somebody else does all the finances, you know, which is nice because I don't really want to deal with the finances, you know? Property management is my sweet spot. So that's one other thought. And then my third thought is, you know, um, researching areas outside of your area, right? Like you were saying, uh, DeAndre, you know, you're in Virginia. Those prices sound phenomenal to me, you know, but I'm not, I, I don't know that market, you know, I know what I know, but if I, you know, if I couldn't invest in the area and, you know, I, I, to me, investing in other areas is a little tricky because I know so much about where I am, but for someone who really, really wants to get into the game, doesn't have as much money, doesn't want it to be the home that they're living in, maybe they like renting because they like living in Manhattan, but they can't afford to buy something because there's crazy restrictions on how much post-closed liquidity you have to have and, and whatnot. Um, maybe they should be talking to people who are investing in Virginia or in other areas and so that they can get involved in that way. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So we have some questions here. I want to start with um, Femi, who says, I live in New Jersey. Buying properties here could be quite expensive. What's your thought about buying investment property in other states with lower living expenses, to your point? What state would you recommend to check out? Any, any, any um, landlord-friendly states. So... Yeah, Virginia happens to be one of them, Florida, Texas, um, you could look more into it. But yeah, I would say land, landlord uh, friendly states. Also, Pennsylvania is is like 50, is kind of landlord friendly and it's not far. So you can get there very quickly and there's some areas that are nice and, and less expensive. So that would be a couple of areas I'd recommend looking into. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Lauren from Tripleman asks, Amy, if you would be willing to share a spreadsheet that you would use, so like you were saying, to keep track of all of the kinds of things you need to note about a property. Because if so, we can include it in, just for everyone who registered for this event, you're gonna be getting an email tomorrow with everyone's contact information so you can reach out for more information, everyone's Instagram handle, everyone's clubhouse handle if applicable, so you can follow and learn, continue to learn from the women on this panel. But Amy, do you have a spreadsheet you could share that we can include in that? I do, I'll, I'll give the um, disclaimer that that spreadsheet changes based on what you're looking for, right? So if you're looking for a short house, you're looking for the weekly or monthly income. If you're looking for an annual rental, you're looking for the annual rental income. If you're looking at a single family versus a condo, there's gonna be factors that are you know, gonna play there. So really what you're gonna include in that spreadsheet is what's applicable to the property search that you're doing. Um, but I'd be happy to share the one that I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So Omer, hello. Uh, for Elise, Omer wants to know, would you consider 75% of the projected rent roll if the property will be purchased vacant? Yes. What we're going to do is we're going to have an appraiser when they go out and appraise the property, they will also give us, it's a, it's a special order that we have to make when we're ordering the appraisal, but we ask for whatever the, the rent roll is going to be. And they, they appraise that for the area. And we'll go by whatever the appraiser says would be fair market rent. Okay, thank you. 
what financing options do you suggest for someone who has the down payment for an investment, but is having a hard time with the banks to get a loan because I don't have a steady W-2? Um, that, that is a problem. Um, yeah, they're, they're going to want to see that you do have income. Um, uh, perhaps there's enough income from, from the property itself. Um, or, um, somebody had mentioned, you know, going in with somebody else, you know, if you have the money and you have a friend that makes money, but doesn't have the money to put down, that would be a good partnership there. Deandra, what would you share? Um, so there's two things I would add, try it. I think some, when we're saying down payment, some guys, some of you are thinking like down payment is being 30 or $40,000, which is like amazing. Right. But if you have that, there are land, there's landlord friendly states where you can buy the whole property for that. Right. When in some of my uh, counties, properties are selling for 35, $40,000. Now the rent might be seven or $800 a month, but you have no mortgage. So yeah, you got to throw $75 a month to taxes, but the rest of that is for you. And the second is um, as someone, so at least I, I giggled, sorry. And I giggled earlier because I left my job last year. So I no longer had income, but I found the complex that I wanted to buy. And so when I went to talk to my lender, she kind of did the same thing at least said like, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> we might have to wait till you get your taxes. But what we were able to set up instead is a seller financing deal um, because the owner owned the property outright. And so instead of using banks, because I tried to avoid banks with some of their fees, what I did was I, he became my bank. So the complex was he wanted like 200 grand for this 12 unit. We agreed on 160 and I had to put down 30, but I now just pay him every month the same way I would pay a bank. And we didn't have to, he didn't check my credit score. Granted, I had history because I have other properties around that area, but that was a way to kind of get around that. He owns it, so it works. And I didn't have to have a W-2 or taxes or anything along those lines because we were able to get in that way. That's great. great and point. Michelle Mamoli, hi Michelle, says that another answer is could be private lenders that do bank statement loans. Okay, I don't know anything about that, but that's interesting. Okay, another question. I'm in New Jersey. This is not a buyer's market. There's hardly any inventory. Do you suggest waiting until end of 2021 into 2022 for actual deals, even though interest rates may be high? I, I think that that's a very blanket statement because um, you can buy a studio or a one bedroom right now and um, get a little bit of a deal uh, in, in, you know, I've seen more now coming through offers, um, you know, two years ago, if you'd come to uh, a seller with 5% with down, you wouldn't have a chance because there's going to be three or four other people that were trying for that same thing with 10%, with 20%, 30% down. So it was really what you were competing with. And we're not seeing that right now in some of the smaller properties. So to just say blanket across the board, it's not, you know, it's not a seller's or buyer's market in New Jersey. It's, it's, it depends on what you're looking at, where you're looking. So I do think that there's still opportunities for certainly in our area for some of the smaller, um, the smaller condos. And those are great little rental properties. And if you're renting yourself right now, you have that, you're spending that money anyway. So um, I think that there's an opportunity uh, right now, for sure, that owners and sellers are more open to accepting offers with the lower down payment than they have been um, in the last 10 years. And please. Um, I, I always say, and I say it to myself too, and like, I, I agree with like buying low and selling high completely, but I always say if the numbers work, the numbers work, right? So like the last property I bought, I got into a bidding war, you know, but that's the one that makes seventy five hundred dollars a week. So you know, in the summer, I'm I'm paying, I'm making money just in the summer months. You know, so I think it's all about the numbers, and I tell that to clients too. Like, okay, so you're you know they're not negotiating with you, but look what you're going to make. Does it matter? You know, so I think it 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 depends on what your goals are, right? Like if you're if it's really truly an investment, and you're looking at what you're making, you know, yearly, then you know, it's, it's, if the numbers work, it's not a bad time to buy. So. I agree with that. And I think that comes back to our conversation about intuition. You know, it's not necessarily about timing the bottom of the market. It's about 
does this make sense and does it feel right? Because I think when you're investing, even if on paper it seems perfect, if it doesn't feel right, obviously that's your intuition. Like, you know, that's not going to work for you. Okay, Amy, were you, uh, you going to add something? Can I say that? Um, just, just a thought on the 10-year treasury yield. So that's something that a lot of lenders will use to kind of base what they're going to price their loans at. And the 10-year treasury yield ticked up to about 1.7. It's back down to like 1.45, 1.5 roughly the last time I checked. We were enjoying a 10-year treasury yield of like one and a quarter for a really long time. That being said, lending rates have gone up. So, you know, whether you have an 800 credit score or you have a 600 credit score. So the idea of waiting, there's, there's two schools of thought on this, right? The first school of thought is that things are going to get worse before they get better for, we might see some foreclosures and some short sales for people who lost their job because of COVID. So there could be opportunities coming down the pike. Um, there's also a school of thought that says if you purchase during the winter months, when there's less buyers, there's less supply, but there's less demand and less people competing for those properties, right? But then the other school of thought, and just kind of going again back to what Pam had said, if the numbers work, the numbers work. It, the idea of waiting, I think some people will wait and they'll miss an opportunity. And you don't want to be in a position where you waited. I, I, have a, I have a financial planning client who told me three and a half years ago that she had X amount of dollars, a ridiculous amount of money sitting in a checking account so that she could buy a home. And three years later, that money's still sitting in a checking account. And she's getting like 0.013%, whatever that number is, right? After inflation, she's lost a lot of money. So I think you have to be decisive um, is the first thing and take the data points that apply today and know that even though Powell has said that he's going to hold interest rates until 2023, there's a, we're seeing them tick up in spite of him not raising them on his own. So I think that was just my little other point of input. Yeah. And I think in some, some cases you'll think, oh, that's way too expensive. I'm not going to buy that thing. And then you end up buying something like way more expensive. So think about it in terms of like, do you want it? Does it make sense? Like we've all said, maybe it's at first, it seems a little too expensive for you, but in the end, it's really actually not, not so, so much. And well, you think, and you think this is a high real estate market. Just like when I bought in 1999, and at that point, it kind of was a high real estate market. But think about that. Think about where that's gone, you know, to today. Because there's, on its way up and down, you know, you're going to see, it, it doesn't just go like this. It, it goes down and up while it goes on its way up. So, um, you just, you know, this, I, I think that this market is, is a very good market to be buying in, even though you might think in your area it's high. Um, it, if, you, if you don't jump in, you're not gonna ever benefit. I agree. I think you just have to jump in. That first purchase is always so scary, but once you, you overcome that first purchase, then the rest is just a lot easier. It, it's just gonna feel more natural, but you just have to, jump in that water <laughs> and make that first purchase. Get your foot in the door and you'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Agreed. Wendy, can you turn your phone? Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so last question for everyone. I could definitely sit here all night and chat and have a million more questions for you, but I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear some kind of closing words. So it's a two-part question for each of you. And the question is, what resources do you recommend to people interested in doing what you've done? And what general advice would you share? So Amy, starting with you, resources and advice. I mean, I would say resources, you know, everything is so accessible now for you to do your research as far as researching properties. I mean, literally it's all on here, right? You can look up Zillow, you can look up Trulia. Um, you can be even more resourceful. And then if there was a certain neighborhood you were targeting or even a building you were targeting, you could contact the owners directly, right? And be and kind of try to, to try to, I guess, be a little bit more direct in your approach. Um, other resources that are available, I mean, I would recommend that everyone speak to a lender, right? Being prepared when it, the time comes, having all that ironed out is a really good place to be. And then, you know, knowing what your plan is, I would say, you know, you have to have a plan. I'm big on writing things down and being very specific and intentional about where you're going and what you're doing. 
And whether that's just writing it in a notebook and having that information somewhere that you can refer back to it in a year, you'll look back in the year and you're like, wow, I said that and I did all of it. It's amazing. Just writing it down, knowing that you have that done. So another resource is really keeping yourself accountable. Uh, and then I would say um, the second part of the question was, was resources and- And advice. Advice, advice, pull the trigger, just go. You know, I mean, you can wait and wait and wait and wait. And then you're, you know, in your forties and you don't own as many properties as you wanted to. And, you know, it, it, like you're, you're always going to want more, right? Always, no matter how successful you are, you're always going to want more because it's just human nature. But I think if you pull the trigger and you get started, you'll, even if you make a mistake, you learn from it, right? So all, those are opportunities for growth. So I think getting started would be the, the number one piece of advice that I would give to people. Do your research and, uh, and take that, that first step. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, Deandra, what um, resources would you recommend and what advice would you share? Yeah, so in terms of resources, I have read the books, I have listened to the podcasts, I have joined the workshops. I would genuinely say, find someone like the people on this call and listen to them. That has been my fastest growth method. I have read all the books. I have watched all the YouTube channels. When I finally got a mentor and some of them paid them to sit with me and walk me through, what took me eight books and 20 hours of YouTube was solved in 30 minutes with more because I now get access to decades of experience for very specific problems instead of even with a, a lease, right? Instead of trying to learn about rates and what's available, you could just go to her and be like, here's my stuff and bam, she can spit out uh, answer for you instead of you spending hours and hours and hours on your own. So I would say like, go like join things like this, but then follow up with people and say like, will you help me specifically? And if there is a price attached to it, pay that price. It saves you so much time. And my piece of advice would be, I do not believe there is one individual choice you're gonna make that's gonna topple this whole thing. I think sometimes people get so afraid of making the wrong choice, making the wrong decision that is gonna set them back a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. I promise there is no one decision that's gonna do that. Oh, but I bought the wrong house. No, you didn't, because what you did was you talked to a realtor, then you tore the house then you maybe ignored an inspection, then you ignored an appraisal, then you lied about your financing, and now you've lost $100,000 on a house. But a lot of stuff happens before then. Just because you spoke to a realtor doesn't mean you're gonna lose $100,000. Just because you put an offer in, just because you pay for an inspection. So don't give it so much weight to hold you back. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make is these, are, uh, these big purchases build off of little things, but they're not so important. <laughs> so give yourself that freedom to mess up or trip on those little things because that's not gonna ruin your whole financial investing career with one choice. Okay, great, great advice. Thank you so much. Okay, Elise, what would you say? What would you recommend resources and advice? Um, very much along the lines of what Amy said, there are so much resources out there that you can look at. You could look at Zillow and Trulia and all these websites. But before I've ever bought anything, I definitely studied the data. Um, all of a sudden I became like a real estate appraiser because I looked at every single listing that was on the market and all the attributes, the price, exactly what it was and, and put everything in a grid, looked at things that have recently sold and kind of tried to come up with my own valuations to see. Because once you really look at the data and take a hard look at it, it sort of makes sense. You become a real estate expert at that moment. You're like, okay, I see that. That one's probably not a good deal because of this, that, and the other thing. You really start to see it when you lay it all out there and examine everything. And it's so easy to find that information now. So definitely do that. Um, and what was, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. <laughs> sure, advice. Advice you would give. Yeah, again, again, go, just go for it. Just... You stop second guessing yourself. Just make that investment jump in. Okay, love that. Thank you. Okay, Natalie, resources and advice. What would you recommend? Going back to what Deandra said, um, find yourself a real estate pro in that area. So that even speaks to if you're thinking about buying another state, find the right person 
that, um, you know, that is going to know the things that you're not going to see black and white on a piece of paper or a listing or on Zillow that is going to be able to say, Ooh, you know what, this kind of floods sometimes, or you're going to hear the train over here, or you're going to have an issue with this because they're going to be building this over here. Like your local real estate professionals have so much information for you um, and, and are able to actually give you a lot more value um, beyond just the, the numbers that you're going to see black and white, like, were they, you know, they're the ones that are going to say, you know, oh, they're going to be building a new school over here, or they're going to be adding a train stop in, you know, the next five years over here, or a ferry's coming, you know, so, and yes, could you do a lot of this research yourself? Of course, but this is what we do. <laughs> like, we know it already, we can save you the time. So I think finding the right, again, going back to the team, having your right lenders, your right real estate professional, your right attorneys, your contractors um, is so important and pay your own mortgage. Stop paying somebody else's, you know, I mean, thankfully people do, you know, as, as um, landlords here, we, we, we love our renters, but you know, if you're in a position that you're thinking about like, why, why not pay your own mortgage, put that own, your money into your own investment, your own future? Uh, maybe it's not the perfect home right away. You know, maybe you've got to start off a little bit small. Maybe you do need to have a roommate to pull it off, but you are going to look back, you know, years later and go, gosh, I'm so glad that I did that. You know, I did that. So do it. Maybe it's not going to be super comfortable right away, but it's, it, you know, it's worth it. Real estate, you know, it, it, we know that it builds wealth. So do it. Absolutely. Love that. Okay. Thank you. Pam, what would you recommend in terms of resources and advice you would share? So resources, I would say, talk to as many people, you know, investing in real estate and like even, you know, a couple realtors before you decide on one, I hate to say it because I don't like when people do it, but like people are going to sell you what they know and what they specialize in. Right. So like I said, I love multifamilies. Like when people talk to me about investing, like that's what I'm focused on. It's because one, it's what I like for people. Two, it's it's what I invest in, you know, a lot and, and what I know best. And that goes for, you know, different types of loans too, right? There are different products and, you know, um, you know, just so many opportunities like seller back financing, bridge loan. Like there's, you know, um, even you know, interest only loans, which you could do for yourself. If you don't have that big, you know, big amount of money that you want to put into the property, you could buy, you know, and then you can make more money every month because you're only paying the interest and you're betting on the market going up. I mean, there's a thousand things you can do. My point being that the more people you talk to, the more opinions you're going to get, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to figure out what your sweet spot, interest, comfortable, you know, what you're comfortable with in, in investing. There's just so many different types of opportunities. So I think just really getting out there. Um, I guess there's not that many networking opportunities in person right now, but that's what I did a lot when I got started. Um, I think making that human connection and, and um, you know, getting help from other people. So I definitely think that is one of the best resources. Um, it's from personal experience. And then in terms of advice, I would just say like someone also told me very, on, uh, very early on when I started real estate, like real estate's a contact sport. You got to be out there, you know? So um, I, you know, for me, and I think I said one of the things about the intuition is like, I know when I go into a home, like this is the right home. It's gonna, the reason why I know that is because I've been into a hundred homes in the last couple months, right? So if you, you know, if, if you want to, and I tell people that all the time, listen, sometimes it's the first home. And honestly, sometimes it is. And I, but I always tell people like, let's go see three more tomorrow so that you feel comfortable with this. You know, the more you're out there, the more you're seeing the the better decisions you're going to make and the the quicker you can act on things, right? So I think just going to open houses, sitting at the coffee shops, you know, doing all those things, being really being in it if you want to be in it. That's my advice. Okay, thank you so much. And just by the way, my dog Jelly Bean is just losing her mind because there's a thunderstorm going on and she's very scared. So she's jumping all over me. Okay, so um, Wendy, what would you say in terms of resources you recommend and advice you would share? Well, I think it's all covered by everybody. Uh, <laughs> I, there are a lot of great advice. And, and um, well, the resource, I think, obviously, you know, we are all limited with our time and we all want to be doing a lot of other things. Um, I would suggest to get yourself a, a 
real estate professional as an agent and he or she will come with a team for you. You know, there's a attorney, there is a contractor, there is a appraiser, there's lenders, there are options. Everybody is in a unique situation. So if you just need to, to get, um, get connected with a, a good agent and, and then you'll be hooked up um, to make the right decision. Um, and then the second part is the advice is pull the trigger. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter how big, doesn't matter how far, doesn't matter how small, doesn't matter how fancy or not, um, pull the trigger. And I think just stop paying rent is going to help you. Agreed. I mean, so for everyone who's with us, you have right here six coaches who specialize in helping you get into the homes that you want. Please reach out to them. Look at their names. They're all on, if you can see the names, they're all on Instagram. They're all, not, not all are on um, Clubhouse, but please follow them, reach out to them. They have a wealth of knowledge that they can help you reach your real estate goals. And we're going to continue doing women in real estate panels. So we hope that you will all join us again. Amy, Elise, Wendy, Deandra, Pam, uh, Natalie. Thank you, Chelsea, for putting this event together. It has been a pleasure to speak with all of you and to hear your wisdom. And we just thank you for sharing it. And we thank you all for joining us, for all of you participants. So thank you so, 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 thank so much. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. A pleasure. Okay, good night. All right, good night, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.